how are we doing? Today, I wanna to go over what our current status is. Um, I wanted to share with you um, our accomplishments of the past year. I wanna give you a little insight into our financial situation. And I wanna introduce you to the broad goals of a new strategic plan that was just approved by our board last weekend at the annual meeting. Um, and then we should have plenty of time for some questions. So currently, um, our museum uh, was closed formally like everything else um, in March. We reopened in July on a three day a week schedule. Normally we're open seven days a week in normal times, but we decided to open Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 11 to four. And this allows us to balance both the, the kind of extra work required to manage public spaces, extra cleaning, extra orientation, um, um, and, and, uh, and balance the human resources we have available to, to meet those extra needs in providing a safe and comfortable visitor experience. <clears throat> Our genealogy center is open by appointment for on-site research, but they are still doing all of their services through phone and, and internet. Um, they continue to take uh, new research and translation requests and are happy to help out uh, with folks. Um, all the genealogy volunteers are also back at their projects. And so that those services continue um, uh, back, back to normal with the exception that we are, we are not currently allowing just drop-in visitors without, without an appointment. Our Jens Jensen Prairie Landscape Park has been a phenomenal resource this year. We have seen so many people, both travelers as well as Elkhorn neighbors and residents, um, make use of the park, the paved trails, the mowed trails. Um, it's been a perfect year to have this beautiful landscape available um, for everyone to share. That's been, that's been a really wonderful asset. And we've seen more people enjoying the park and using the park this year. Our design store has also um, managed to pivot to, uh, to really emphasizing online orders and phone orders. Um, the store has never closed through this year. Um, and so we've seen a lot of people reaching out. Um, we saw a lot of orders for jigsaw puzzles <laughs> in this spring as, as a lot of people, you know, were and, you know, preparing for, for their own kind of lockdown. Lots of jigsaw puzzles um, were, were purchased from our design store. And every staff member is working. Everyone is doing their job behind the scenes or in, in the visitor services role. Um, we have not furloughed or laid off any staff this year. And in fact, we have filled open positions. So we're really pleased that we're able to stay concentrated on so many of the programs and services that are the core of what we do. Among our accomplishments of the last year, um, a lot of our live programs moved to online formats. And one example of that is our brown bag lunch series. This is a snapshot of the museum's YouTube channel. And you can see these are just, each one of these boxes is a new video that has been shared on our YouTube channel in the last five months. Everything from our brown bag lunch programs, which have switched to a digital format, to specific behind the scenes videos that staff has done. We did a whole series of things around preparing for um, Sanktansaften or Danish style midsummer. Um, and and uh, our um, archives collection manager has done some fun archive at home, you know, tips on how you can care for your own archival collections from your family. So, um, so that's been a, an excellent success. Specifically in our Nordic Cuisine YouTube channel, which is separate from the museum channel, this accompanies our traveling exhibition. We have launched 15 new videos on food stories, recipes, how-to demonstrations, um, interviews, cocktails, uh, a lot of a, a lot of great um, you know great resources here. Um, here's one that's been particularly uh, <laughs> um, uh, attractive to a, to apparently 1,300 people. 
since April, Swedish potato dumplings seems to be really meeting a need for comfort food here. And in fact, we were um, we were approached by um, Insider, uh, which is a um, internet kind of magazine platform, to use some clips from this video in a video they're putting together of dumplings around the world. So we look forward to see how our content is then further being shared with an even wider audience. We have opened a brand new exhibition and it is beautiful. Um, it is called Art Nouveau Innovation, Danish Porcelain from an American Collector. And this has been in the works for a couple of years. It was originally scheduled to open in June, but because of our closures and because of the difficulty in traveling to pick up the pieces, we delayed that and it just opened on October 2nd. I'll share a couple pictures with you from this exhibition. Um, a, a wonderful uh, selection of pieces that really highlight this period of time when Danish porcelain led the world in innovation in both technical innovation and design innovation. You can see here that it, our gallery is just chock full of, of pieces of every shape and size. Um, some of these pieces themselves were on display at some of the most prominent world's fairs of the late 19th and early 20th century, including the Chicago Columbian Exposition in 1893. This elegant piece with a mouse <laughs> um, is, is kind of a, uh, a crowd favorite. Um, and if you find this piece appealing, um, you are in excellent company because the first owner of this piece was Louis Comfort Tiffany, of famous for his glass design, of course. This box of small vases shows this beautiful range of crystalline glazes and snakeskin glazes, um, wonderful range of color, which was literally brand new at the time that these were being produced. And both Bing and Grundahl and Royal Copenhagen led the way. Dr. Todd Reiser is the collector of this, of all of these pieces. His father started this collection of Danish porcelain and he has continued it. Um, so he has been a wonderful partner in both uh, lending us these works, helping with the selection of what would help really tell this story from this period. Um, and, and he has done so much research on this collection that it's, there are so many stories to tell. Um, it's been wonderful to, to have him involved. He was present for the exhibit opening and we were able to film a gallery talk, which is as of noon today available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. So you can hear him talking about both the history of this period and pointing out individual highlight pieces. And we were able to improvise an opening event. Um, again, not how we would usually do an exhibit opening reception, um, but working through the parameters of, of how we can safely gather people together, but not too many at a time. We had an open house on October 2nd, um, uh, where we knew we had to limit piece of people in the galleries, but still allow a chance for people to ask Dr. Reiser their questions about about these pieces and really be among the first to enjoy this exhibition. And this is a traveling exhibit. So I know a lot of you will not have an opportunity to visit Elkhorn between now and January 3rd, but this uh, will be traveling for the next two years. And we will be reaching out to additional museums to see if there's further interest in extending that tour. Um, uh, right now, you can see that there are two more Iowa venues in Ames and in Dubuque, and then the Flint Institute of Art um, in Michigan next summer and fall. So, so there are further opportunities to enjoy these pieces in person. Other accomplishments um, really in, uh, include uh, maintaining the online presence of our design store um, that people were still able to shop um, even though, even when we were closed to visitors and even though we, uh, um, people couldn't see things in person, um, we have a really wonderful variety of things and very unique items that people are looking for. So, so that's, a, that's a fun way to, to meet people's Danish needs uh, from wherever they are. 
Um, I think you know we have to be proud of the fact that we have kept 100% of our employees um, on staff and productive doing the jobs they were hired to do. That's so that's a, an important accomplishment in this year. And our membership um, continues to represent all 50 states, Washington, D.C., the Virgin Islands, and six countries. Um, a, a lot of museums are seeing their membership dip um, considerably, especially if would they haven't been able to reopen. Why maintain a membership if you can't visit the museum? But our members are, are tend to be so loyal to the mission of this institution and the, the larger uh, goal to preserve Danish and Danish American culture um, so that our, our members have, uh, have really stepped up to support us. And we developed and approved a new strategic plan to guide the next three years. And I'll discuss that a little bit later. Now, some of you might be curious how we're doing on the money side. And so I put together a couple of colorful pie charts um, for those of you who are not so interested in numbers, don't worry, it's just two pie charts. We'll, we'll be through this. Um, the revenue from the past fiscal year, and our fiscal year ends August 31st. So this is a pretty recent summary here. Um, most, the, the largest chunk of our revenue comes from individual annual gifts that members and donors make. That includes membership renewals, that includes any responses to our appeal letters, that includes gifts that are for special programs or, or projects. All of those are in this large, largest um, membership and contribution uh, uh, wedge. The orange pie slice is bequests and memorials. And this has always been a pretty significant part of the, the money that helps fund the operational expenses every year. And so we, um, you know, we were fortunate to, to be remembered in, in people's estate plans and, and receive some of that support in this year when it was so, um, so welcome. About 10% of our uh, um, revenue comes from grants and designated uh, project gifts. This bright yellow 7%, that's earned income. And that's a combination of admissions, um, event fees, of retail stores from the design store and um, uh, services that we provide um, through the genealogy center or through exhibit rentals, other kind of fees for services. That's, that's what goes into earned income. And certainly we would like that pie to be larger, but a lot of that is affected by not being open fully to the public as well. We just don't have as many people coming and paying admission. We don't have as many sales on site. And so that, that does affect us. 12% of our cash for this year came from distributions from our endowment. And that's a really significant pie slice and one that we, um, that we over the next few years would like to see grow. We would like to see that this endowment pie slice grow and our dependence on bequests shrink. That's one of our long range plans. And a full 10% of our revenue um, from the past fiscal year came from being su successfully receiving one of the PPP loans that was part of the Federal CARES Act of corona, uh, coronavirus relief package. So 10% of that, um, of, our, of our entire operating budget for the year came through that program. So that also was quite significant. And where do we spend that money every year? More than half goes to personnel expenses. All of the things that our museum does and does really well is because of a talented and skilled and very dedicated staff team. And you know, to keep those staff um, um, employed and, and productive uh, without, without any furloughs this year, without any layoffs, that's, um, that's a major accomplishment for, for this year in this time. 
the staff do need some supplies um, to do their work, and that's where 9% um, of programs, additional program expenses, um, that could be the software needed to, um, to do research or manage our collections database. Those are the supplies um, and contract uh, printing, specialized printing for our exhibitions. Um, it's uh, all of the extra, extra tools that staff need to implement the things we do. 13% of our expenses are in facilities and grounds, and that's everything from building insurance to electricity bills to um, uh, maintaining the Prairie Landscape Park. Communications is 5%, and that includes both online, um, Facebook, uh, advertisements, promotions, as well as the printing costs for our America letter. 11% is administrative and fundraising fees. Um, those are a lot of the office supplies, computer support, the general overhead that we just need to run this business. And then 8% are for capital expenses, big projects, big maintenance, um, you know, tangible um, big ticket items that, that help. And in the big picture, our general annual operating budget is about $1.3 million. Current assets on hand from cash to shop inventory are just over 1 million. Our fixed assets, um, which includes the value of our buildings, the furnishings, our exhibits, our vehicles, about four and a half million. And as of the end of September, our endowment accounts um, totaled just over $5 million. So our total assets for this institution is $10.6 million. But of course, you always have to ask about the other side of that equation, and that's liabilities. The PPP loan is currently still a loan. We have submitted our application to have that loan forgiven, which is the kind of the expected process. We have no other debt, and that is also a really great place to be. And I want to, to point out that not only is this kind of strong place to be part of um, strong support in this year and opportunities in this year, but it is also due to, um, to plans put in place many years ago. And I wanted to call out just a few examples of that. Um, Peter Kierkegaard was a Danish immigrant in Wisconsin. Um, he was for a short time a board member for our museum. And in his estate plans, he set up a series of individual trusts for his, the children and grandchildren who were his heirs. Each one of those trusts is set up to provide um, a set amount of income for the heir in their lifetime but on their death, the residual comes entirely to the museum. Well, in February of last year, 2019, one of Peter's daughters, Ingrid, suddenly passed away. And this was not expected. She had a sudden heart attack. The value of that trust immediately came to the museum. And that was an excess of $800,000. This was a, a complete unlooked for um, gift at that time. And we chose at that time to set it up as a cash reserve account. This is something that the museum had really never had before, um, but to hold that in an interest bearing account that could be more easily accessed than our endowment accounts. Having that in hand this year in 2020, we have not had to use a lot of those funds a little bit, not a lot, but having that available has really made the difference in being able to face these, navigate these, these waters with confidence and knowing that we were not nearing a monthly crisis in, in meeting our, our expenses every month. So being able to have that already in hand um, and, and as a resource has been a, a huge asset for our institution in in remaining optimistic and moving forward with confidence. Earlier this year, we learned of the Bodil Sorensen Trust. Now, Bodil Sorensen actually 
um, passed away 20 years ago. Um, but at in her estate, she had set up her um, a, a charitable remainder trust, which provided for her heirs for 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, whatever was left was being divided between four charitable entities, the museum being one of them. So here we are the benefit in this year of plans put in place over 20 years ago. Eric and Anna, An or, excuse me, Eric and Anna Anderson um, were in the St. or excuse me, Kansas City area. And they similarly set up a charitable trust um, on the death of both of them. Um, Eric passed away a few years ago and Anna passed away um, earlier in 2020. Um, that, uh, that their estate would be divided by certain proportions among their, their um, charities. And so we received a portion of that. And fortunately, um, not everyone who makes a, a major difference to the museum has to pass away in order to do so. Um, Lowell and Marilyn Cramey are, are, to our great satisfaction, still very much with us. Um, and they chose to make a major gift um, last year and were interested in, in kind of what would really help the institution both um, in our operations and in our long-term financial health. So with their interest in our fine arts and exhibitions programs, they chose to help us upgrade some of our main floor art gallery systems, especially the lighting. They have now dedicated that gallery in honor of the volunteers and staff for whom the museum has been a long time commitment. And that plaque is now on the, on the walls as, as that dedication. The remainder of their gift has been invested in our endowment to help grow that, that long-term sustainable part of the pie. And these are just a few. There have been so many people over the years um, who have helped build this institution to where it is today and help set the foundation for us being able to face this very uncertain year and the uncertainties of the future um, with, with a sense of, of confidence and optimism. And so with that, we, um, we felt that we could proceed with our strategic plan, a process that actually began two years ago. Two years ago, we did not know that 2020 would be the year it would be. <laughs> um, and so uh, as, as things started to unfold, our strategic planning committee had some conversations about, do we need to maybe shift our, our thought process about strategic planning? Do we need to reprioritize certain things? And, and the conclusion was really, no, no, because the strategic priorities that we've been talking about in this plan are still critical for our institution to address. The difference in this strategic plan is there's a couple. Um, one is it's for three years. Previously, we'd had five-year plans, um, but we really wanted to use the next strategic plan period to um, as a period of inquiry to figure out where the, the next direction for sustainable growth for our institution would be. And in order to do that, we really need to explore and answer some pretty key questions. The first one is, who is our audience? Our museum is about 37 years old right now. And we are so blessed to still be able to know and work with and interact with many of our founding members. But a lot of our, the founding members have, um, you know, have passed away and we are shifting to the next generation of leaders and looking ahead to the, the following generation of who will be the museum's members, supporters and leaders in the next generation. So as we look at that demographic shift and bridge from the founders to the next generation, who is that audience? Is it to be found in the immediate Southwest Iowa or, or regional um, area between Des Moines and Omaha? Um, should we be really emphasizing outreach to a national, uh, national audience? Um, and so we, we really want to explore how do we engage the members and visitors of, of the future. 
And along with that, but with its own focus, is membership. What are the what is the membership structure? How do we how do we shape a membership uh, benefits that really inspire people and and attract their commitment um, and uh, and support of of our institution? Uh, and all of these things overlap with the collections. Are are we collecting the things that really match the type of stories and audience interests that that stem out of that within within our mission? How does the genealogy center um, fit within that? Are we offering the services that people need? Are we keeping up with um, the interests and, and wants of, of current family history researchers? And the Jens Jensen Prairie Landscape Park, how can that be an asset that enhances the overall visitor experience? Um, how can it engage even more people that may have an interest in ecology and native tall grass prairie that don't necessarily have a, a genetic connection or ancestral connection to Denmark. And there is always a financial aspect to any strategic plan. You know, what are, what do we need to aim for to really build that um, long-term financial stability? And then do we have the human resources um, on the staff level, at the board level, and volunteers in extra um, you know, contract services that can, that can really help develop and implement these new initiatives? Whew. That's the big overview in about half an hour. 